Good morning, everyone. My name is Caitlin Yeager. I'm the Director of Heritage Programs for Missouri Humanities. Our mission is to enrich lives and strengthen communities by connecting Missourians with the people, places, and ideas that shape our society. Thank you so much for joining us today for Chapter 1 of Explore Missouri's German Heritage, an eight-part program series that delves into each chapter of the book of the same title by W. Arthur Merhoff. The series will continue every second Thursday of the month at 10 a.m. from now through April. The book is available for purchase. I'll be posting the link to buy the book in the chat box on Zoom and in the comments on the Facebook Live video. They're $25 each and all proceeds will help us continue to bring free public programs such as these to Missourians. Whether you're joining us through Zoom or watching on Facebook Live, we invite you to interact with us throughout the program. If you're on Facebook, feel free to comment to let us know you're watching or to ask questions for us to consider. If you're on Zoom, feel free to submit questions throughout the program using the chat feature or the Q&A feature, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. If you enjoy our program today and are interested in seeing more from Missouri Humanities, please check us out on Facebook or on our website for the most up-to-date information about our events. We also have a membership program where benefits include free books, discounted tickets to special programs, and access to members-only events. To become a member, visit mohumanities.org and click Memberships under the Donate tab. After our program today, I'll be sending everyone an email with a link to our program survey. I would really appreciate it if you could all take the time to let us know what you thought of the presentation. These surveys are really important as we continue to bring public programming to Missourians and work toward a more thoughtful, informed, and civil society. Now, without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to my co-host for this eight-part program, uh, the author of the publication, Dr. Arthur Merhoff. An introduction from me couldn't possibly do him justice, so I will let him tell you a bit about his background, what led him to work with us on many of our heritage programs, and his writing of the book before we dive into some discussion with Arthur and with all of you. So Arthur, I will let you take it from here. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, um, both with your career and with Missouri Humanities. Thank you very much, Caitlin. It's a pleasure and it's an honor to be involved here with Missouri Humanities and working again with you. Um, Caitlin and I have been road warriors for Missouri Humanities for some time now, working with communities throughout the state on cultural heritage, uh, interpretation. So what my involvement with the German Heritage Corridor and with the Explore Missouri's German Heritage uh, publication, I don't call it a book and you'll, I'll explain why in just uh, a little bit, but a little bit of background is that uh, I started out as an educator. My uh, bachelor's degree is in um, education actually, BS in education from Concordia College in uh, Nebraska, taught in uh, Detroit um, in the center city for a while, and then worked and went to uh, uh, St. Louis, returned my, my hometown of St. Louis, and obtained a master's degree in urban affairs from Washington University in St. Louis in the mid-70s, and worked in planning, design, historic preservation for about a decade, and then back in the mid-80s, uh, went to St. Louis University, where I obtained a doctorate in uh, American studies, some people call it American culture studies, with an emphasis um, in, these, in material culture, in what objects, uh, the built environment, reveal about our culture. So that's a little bit of my background. I've uh, written three books, four if you count this one. I'm, I'm still hedging my bets on that, but... Uh, um, <laughs> Um, one, one bit of information, when I graduated from St. Louis University, I applied for a position in uh, Tübingen, um, in what was then West Germany, um, to teach American culture studies, and I was one of the finalists, uh, and I was invited to guest lecture at the University of Tübingen about uh, Missouri, well, Missouri life, if you will, and I focused upon uh, the Missouri, 
what's now called the Missouri-German Heritage Corridor. Some people call it Deutschheim or the Missouri Rhineland. So um, I've had an interest in this for a long time. And uh, so there's both a scholarly background and uh, also an applied interest in placemaking. And uh, I've worked as a museum educator at the Museum of Westwood Expansion, which most of you know as the Gateway Arch, but it's really more than that. And then for 10 years, I worked as the academic coordinator for the Museum of Art and Archaeology um, at the University of Missouri in Columbia. And that's kind of how I got involved in the Missouri Humanities German Heritage Corridor Initiative. But well, I'll save that for later. And I've had, I've had the pleasure of working, as I mentioned, with Caitlin on cultural heritage workshops throughout the state of Missouri. So I think there's a real affinity between those workshops and uh, what we're doing with the German Heritage Corridor Initiative. So let's just say I'm a friend of Missouri Humanities. <laughs> you definitely are a friend of us. Um, so, so you mentioned the German Heritage Corridor, um, and that's kind of where I want to start. So I'm going to give a little bit of background um, to this German Heritage Corridor that Arthur brings up and how that led us to um, commissioning this book with Missouri Life. Um, so our current executive, executive director, uh, Steve Belko, um, began as executive director in 2015, um, and he's the one that came up with this idea for um, a massive program uh, that would draw attention to, um, in simple terms, draw attention to the rich German roots in Missouri. Um, and the big question was how to do it. Uh, as, as many people know, um, you know, Missouri isn't the most German state in the country, but it is very German and it's widespread throughout the state. It's not just one area, um, one county, but it's, it's all over the state. So, um, you know, how do we, how do we interpret or how do we um, commemorate the heritage of, of such a widespread group of people in the state? Um, and Steve's idea was to focus on kind of what I call a guinea pig area of the state. Um, an area that would bring focus to the topic uh, of German heritage and kind of set an example for uh, how we can interpret it throughout the state and not just in this you know, guinea pig area. Um, so that guinea pig area became the German heritage corridor. Um, and the region that we chose was the Missouri River Valley. Um, so the picture on your screen is a picture that Steve took, a very impressive picture in my opinion, that Steve <laughs> took um, in what we call the German Heritage Corridor uh, back uh, several years ago. And this is, um, I don't exactly remember where in the corridor it is, but I do know it's along Highway 94. You can see the Missouri River there in the background, the beautiful, you know, countryside along the Missouri River. There's a vineyard over there to your left. So it's really the, the most perfect example of the, the natural environment, the built environment, the agriculture, of the corridor area. Um, but this picture is also a really great example of why, um, why Germans came to Missouri in the first place. You know, it was scenes like this uh, that Gottfried Duden, a German explorer and writer, saw when he came to Missouri, or what was then, you know, the Western states of North America, uh, when he wrote his book about his journey. So, he came here, he saw that the Missouri River Valley was, um, was picturesque, was beautiful, was a great opportunity area, and it happened to look very similar to the Rhineland in Germany. Um, so this was a kind of a period of, of, not kind of, it was very much a period of uh, political, religious, social upheaval in Germany. Um, and when Gottfried Duden returned and he wrote about this, uh, people were inspired to, to start a new life uh, there in the United States and more specifically in this area of um, what was then the Western United States that reminded them of home. Um, so this Missouri River Valley was kind of an inspiring area and, and they came uh, slowly at first, you know, early 18, late 1820s, early uh, 1830s um, groups started to come over 
And then as the revolutions in Germany continued uh, into the 1840s, especially the, the 1848 revolution that you hear about, um, they came by the thousands. Um, massive immigrant groups would come here um, and start to settle the Missouri River Valley area. And again, they did settle throughout Missouri. It was not just the corridor area. However, the corridor area is heavily concentrated German settlements um, and continue to be very German towns to this day. Um, so we came up with this idea, like I said, for a designated corridor. Um, so the screen you see now uh, is what has become the corridor. So it begins in St. Louis City and follows the Missouri River along 16 counties um, north and south of the Missouri River, all the way to Lafayette County in the west. Um, the blue dots that you see represent um, several of the, of the German communities that were founded um, in Missouri along the corridor area. Uh, and a few of the ones that are labeled are just some of the, the major ones that, that we tend to do um, some programming about. Um, you see Herman on there. Obviously, Herman is something that is, a, is an area that people tend to think of when they think of German Missouri because Herman uh, makes their priority to, to really capitalize on their German cultural heritage. But smaller places like Piers, Dutzau, Dutzau being one of the first German settlements in Missouri, um, Arrow Rock, another smaller community um, that, you know, but has very deep German roots. So a lot of these uh, communities really. Uh, you know, really spend the time and the effort to make sure that they interpret and share this cultural heritage. Um, and that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to create something that connected these communities with a common goal. And that is to commemorate, to celebrate, to explore, and to educate about not only the history of Germans in our state, but also how their contributions uh, helped our state grow and develop. Um, so that would be agriculture, business, industry, um, you know, it's no, no, it's no uh, mystery that German wine is a, is a major industry uh, in Missouri, especially in this corridor area. Um, so, like I said, the corridor itself is a great little guinea pig area because it's heavily concentrated. But now, as you see, the corridor in the context of the state of Missouri um, is just a smaller portion. But those dots that you see all throughout the state, um, those are all other pockets of German communities, German heritage in Missouri. So it really is widespread. Um, it's not just this area, but it has served as a nice starting point for us to gauge interest among the stakeholders in these communities. Um, and it was quite unanimous, unanimous that this was something big and important that we wanted to explore and to plan public programming around. Um, so we started, uh, like I said, by gauging interest, starting to build an audience that might be interested in these kinds of topics. Um, we began some branding initiatives, you know, creating that corridor, um, getting people to start using the language of the German Heritage Corridor. Um, you know, I, I know I work for Missouri Communities and I work with the German Heritage Corridor, but I find myself saying, um, you know, if I'm in if I'm in Washington, if I'm in Augusta, um, you know, I say things like, you know, I'm going through the corridor. Um, I'm in the corridor, you know, so we want to create that language of people being in this area and knowing and saying that they are in the German Heritage Corridor. Um, that kind of representation, that kind of awareness is what we're looking for. Um, you even we, changed your name, didn't you? <laughs> yes, yeah, so my, my, uh, my boss, Steve, uh, used to joke when I first came on because my maiden name is very Irish. Um, but I was engaged when he, when I came on and he would joke when we had these public events about establishing the corridor that my stipulation for being hired was that I had to take on a German name and I happened to be engaged to someone with a German surname. So, uh, so that was a fun little joke that he liked to like to tell. And unfortunately, he's got to think of a new joke now. Um, but so we started with some branding, like I said, creating the corridor, uh, but also creating a logo that people um, could recognize when they see it, they know that we're talking about something very specific here. And that is um, on the screen, our German Heritage Corridor logo. Um, to explain it a bit, it's very obvious in that that's the state of Missouri. Uh, that is the colors of um, the German flag. And that swirl in the middle there represents the Missouri River and how um, representative of the Missouri River, how symbolic the Missouri River is of this initiative. Um, it's really what connects all of these communities in the corridor. Um, we drafted and passed legislation with the state of Missouri. So uh, there is, it is actually written into law that this is um, officially, according to Missouri law, the German Heritage Corridor of Missouri. That was uh, signed 
by Governor Jay Nixon in 2016. So it is very much official that this exists, which was a really big, um, big boon for us to, to really start raising some awareness and some funding for programming. Um, so like I said, we continue to raise awareness, coordinating all these efforts that meant by the time we were drafting up our interpretive plan, implementing public programming, um, creating this publication that we had a really good base audience to start with and then expand upon. Um, so kind of where this leaves us with, uh, with this publication is, um, you know, how did we get to the point of wanting to write some sort of book, some sort of publication to start us off? Because this book journey really began before a lot of other official activities started, such as public programming, such as creating an interpretive plan. So um, we first started a, a formed a project team to lead our efforts and help establish our goals with the end game being public programming exhibits, digital public history projects, oral histories, and publications that would help us document, explore, and commemorate Missouri's German heritage. Uh, we then formed a larger scholar team and together these groups attended a series of meetings that helped us devise the components of an interpretive plan. And an interpretive plan, for those of you that might not know, um, kind of serves as your blueprint when you're, when you're creating a big program or starting a big project. So it basically told us um, after the series of meetings and, and the, the man we hired to help us create this interpretive plan, the end product was a document that told us um, basically what we should do based on these conversations and how we should do it. Um, it's essentially a 10 year plan that we actually began implementing in 2018. So we are a couple years into this 10 year plan. Uh, we held a launch event in Jefferson City um, once the interpretive planning period started, uh, once that legislation was signed to help commemorate it and to explain you know, what our goals were for this project. And then of course, what brings us today is the commissioning of this publication. Um, this idea was once again, one of Steve's, our, our, our idea man, um, and he decided to go to Missouri Life to help us publish this book. Uh, Missouri Life is a very well respected, very well known um, publication organization um, in Missouri, and we knew that they would have the audience and the expertise we needed um, to really get this book where it needed to be. We started some preliminary research to establish the scope, um, and a lot of those meetings that we had with the interpretive plan and grant writing um, helped us better define the themes of the book. Um, and Arthur's participation on that project team and in those meetings um, is what solidified him as the author. Um, he expanded on the ideas that surfaced in that process and um, fast forward a couple years and here we are. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and get some questions to Arthur and have him uh, help us start to understand this book. Um, so this, this program, like I said, is a series. Chapter one of the book is really kind of an introduction. So this is our opportunity to talk a little bit about um, what to expect as you read the book, um, kind of what were the foundations for the book and how we came up with the themes um, as this book took shape. So um, again, we want your questions and participation as we continue for the rest of this hour. Um, so if you've got a question as, they, as, as Arthur is talking, as I'm talking, please feel free to submit those. Like I said, you can use um, the comment section on the Facebook Live video, or if you're on Zoom, you can use the chat feature and the Q&A feature. And um, I'll pose those questions as they are relevant to the conversation. Um, and then we'll try and get any uh, last lingering questions towards the end of the program, maybe in the last 10 minutes or so. Um, so with that said, Arthur, uh, I'm gonna start with kind of a big question. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we aren't the most German state in the country. There are lots of other states that, that claim to be extremely German. Um, there's lots of other ethnicities and cultures that make up the population of Missouri. So why German heritage? Talk to us a little bit about why um, it's important or why we chose to, to do German heritage as a focus. The um, image that you showed in with your slides where you showed the German heritage corridor in relation to the state of Missouri, I thought was very telling and a, a very powerful visual. Um, as you pointed out, uh, Missouri doesn't necessarily have the most, didn't have the most people of German descent. Um, certainly issues of immigration, of assimilation, of you know, ethnic conflict have been part of 
the German experience throughout Mis the experience of Missouri's Germans in the you know the mid 19th century. Um, you could look back to German experiences in um, Pennsylvania, for example, in the Northeast um, earlier, and you'll see similar phenomenon. But it's that image that you showed of the German Heritage Corridor and its relationship to the state of Missouri that I think to me is one of the most compelling images. And I think it also resonated with members of the German Heritage Corridor Initiative Symposia and the discussions. <clears throat> Missouri's Germans in the 19th century were the sharp edge of the spear. If you look at that, Missouri was a slave state and Germans, German immigrants, by and large, were overwhelmingly anti-slavery. And they were very clear that they did not want to give up feudal lords for plantation masters. And, uh, and that was a, a big theme, um, this idea of Freiheit or freedom. Um, you know, you don't come over here to, and give up what you fought for you know, you'd lost, if you will, the revolution in, back in Germany. But here's your chance to achieve that kind of freedom, to start over, if you will, and to then give that up uh, was unacceptable. And so they're in the middle of a slave state surrounded. Um, Missouri has an area called Little Dixie, um, which is where Columbia, Missouri was located. So. Missouri's Germans were not just having to try and and um, deal with the usual issues involved with, if you will, assimilation or acculturation or, or becoming adapting to a new culture. They were also, in a sense, forging a new culture against some fairly serious opposition and in particular the involvement of Missouri, Missouri's Germans in the Civil War effort, in the Union Army effort, um, became critical. And so it was a key part of their identity. And this conflict, if you will, certainly in the Civil War, but again, we'll see it later in the First World War, this tension between their Germanness and uh, what was happening in America, I think made them a kind of crucible and, if you will, <laughs> It was a refiner's fire and it made it, there was perhaps even greater conflict than say being German in New York. Um, granted, you had a lot of the same issues, but um, you're playing it out on a very different stage. And uh, I think that heightened tension, anytime that your culture is called into question, I think is a, is a great way to try and understand your culture, anybody who's traveled and tried to explain American culture to visitors or to not visitors, you're the visitor, to other people realizes um, how difficult that is and how you really have to define what is special about being from Missouri, being from America. Um, and I think that's what makes uh, Missouri's German heritage particularly interesting to me and I think it was kind of a focal point for the uh, symposia of the German Heritage Corridor Initiative as well. Yeah and I think um, you bring up some really good points there and that is um, you know this idea of, of you know this heritage that, that to me I feel like now that I know more about it it seems obvious that Missouri is very German, um, but you know, I, I, I have to say that before I started working here and started working on this project, I had no idea of the magnitude of the effect of German immigration to Missouri. Um, and I think it's because we see things at face value. Um, you know, I knew that Herman was like a little German town in Missouri. I knew that German wine was a big deal. Um, you know, I, so there were, you know, very obvious things that you see that should tell you something or make you maybe expand a little bit and see, okay, well, if Herman's German, then what else is German? You know, if the German wine industry is such a big deal in Missouri, what other industries that were German led were, were a big deal in Missouri? 
Um, but then as you kind of look look deeper and you, and you bring up, um, I think you maybe brought up a little bit about um, wartime uh, and how this, this role of Germans kind of evolved when it came to ideas of conflict, uh, the role of Germans in Missouri during World War II, or not, sorry, not World War II, during the Civil War. Um, but then you see that evolve over time to World War I and World War II, where, um, you know, a few generations earlier, uh, Germans were, um, you know, leading the charge to help fight against, um, against the Confederacy. They were big Union supporters. They fought for the Union Army. Um, and then all of a sudden they were uh, something to be cautious about. The German culture was, um, was to be hidden. Um, you know, it was, it was very difficult all of a sudden to be German. Um, you know, so this, this change in just a matter of a couple generations is something else that I think um, is very interesting and somewhat unique to, to German-ness in, and not just in Missouri, but throughout the country. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in us exploring that more. I know that's, that's coming deeper into the book, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's fascinating. And I think that that's another reason why this topic is so important because, uh, you know, I'm not the only person that, that, you know, realizes that, you know, this German cultural heritage is way more important than I ever thought it was. And I, I you know, I think that's why it's even more important for us to, to continue to explore this so people can realize the effect of this people, these people on, on our state. Um, and then that, that kind of leads me to my next question. And, um, you know, there's, there's lots of themes um, throughout the book. And, uh, you know, you touch on material culture, viticulture, food traditions, um, but place clearly rises above them all as, as very important. And I know you have a, a background in, um, you know, talking about placemaking and, and the importance of place. So, so talk about your decision to, to focus on the idea of place um, as you wrote this book. I think you used the phrase cautious when hiding German heritage. I thought that's a real understatement. But uh, that's, an, that's another part of the story. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> obviously, um, without giving much away, I'm interested in place and kind of a focal point of my own academic research and the placemaking that I've done in community design, historic preservation, etc. But it was actually a discussion, I recall, from the German Heritage Corridor Initiative, one of the symposia, and uh, it really revolved around place. And basically, in you know, this collection of incredible scholars in Missouri's German heritage, we're, we're asking that question, what's, what really is this sense of place that we're always talking about? So it, it wasn't just my decision, it wasn't just a theme that's uh, unique to me, although I certainly spent a lot of time and effort trying to understand it, but it was that particular symposium discussion that really resonated because it seemed as though all of the previous discussions kind of came together into, all right, what is special about this, this German heritage corridor? And, uh, you know, you pointed out enough there's certainly the aspects of uh, German craftsmanship, uh, music, et cetera, lots, lots of things, lots of ways that one could go language, obviously, but I think what most people recalled was, and again, goes back to that spatial uh, relationship that we saw, is that there was something about that corridor, that region, that spatial area that seemed to make it different from other parts of Missouri. Missouri depends on where you're from. And uh, <clears throat> I also have done enough reading that other scholars who have studied Missouri's Germanness, their German, our German heritage, had pointed that out as well. Uh, Russell, Russell Gerlach was a geographer at, uh, was it, I guess, what it used to be Southwest Missouri State. Um, hope I'm getting that right, but uh, he'd written an excellent article comparing Germans in the Ozarks to, if you will, Anglo-American culture and how 
much concern Germans had for permanence, for um, continuity, for taking care of the land um, compared to some of the more wasteful practices he saw there. So it, it shows up in the scholarship as well, as well as the conversation that uh, uh, we had among ourselves. And because of my own interest as well, place is all encompassing. It's multivalent, if you will. It, it comes, you can look at it from a lot of different vantages, from a lot of different angles. You know, there, you can look at the sociology of place, you can look at architecture, um, landscape, um, economics, factors in. So um, lots of different ways to, to cross section the idea of place, but it seemed like a good organizing principle as well for um, this publication as a way to bring a lot of disparate elements together in a fairly short, um, compact uh, publication. And I think too, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think too, you know, it was, I don't want to say an obvious choice, but you know, the, the very idea of, of the corridor is the fact that it's a place. I mean, the corridor itself is a regional effort and it's in its inspiration was the Missouri River Valley. So, and, and the idea of place and placemaking would be, you know, capitalizing on why, why we chose a place, why a place deserves to be um, preserved or interpreted or shared or explored. Um, and that ended up being the, the very foundation of establishing something like the German Heritage Corridor. Um, so, you know, I think you're, you're right on the money there in, in picking place as such a, a prominent theme. Um, can we, can so we apologize in advance to people <laughs> in Concordia and in Perry County that we didn't forget you. We're, no. <laughs> we're very much aware of that German heritage. Um, it's just that um, for a lot of reasons that the spatial aspect of the corridor uh, became important, but that's, that's certainly not all of Missouri's German heritage. Of course, and, that, and that's something I try and make abundantly clear too. Um, and I, I actually work very closely with Perry County and, and doing um, similar efforts to, to document and uh, and explore their German heritage. Um, it's very unique down in Perry County. Um, you know, there, you know, someone actually, this, this brings in a, a great uh, question, um, kind of a two-part question um, about where major, Missouri's German immigrants or were Missouri's German immigrants from certain regions in Germany or from throughout the country. And I think we find that um, it's a little bit of both. I mean, you know, a lot of times you find that, uh, you know, places, in Missouri that were established as German communities were often named for the communities in Germany or the areas in Germany where they came from. Um, there are several examples of that, but I also know that uh, in Perry County, um, there's a, a couple extremely specific and, and concentrated groups of German uh, immigrants and German descendants that lived there. Um, two off the top of my head I know are Baden Germans and Bavarian Germans that are of two very prominent German groups that are represented in Perry County. Um, it's also but, fair to say that they didn't always play well together. Exactly. Yes, very <laughs> much so. And a lot of that had to do um, with religion. You know, some. You know, a lot of times there was a Catholic German group versus a Lutheran German group, or or otherwise. Um, and and you know that's certainly telling of history, not just in German history, but. Uh, many other immigrant groups that, you know, were very much categorized that by the religions they practiced or the areas where they came, the languages they spoke, um, you know, and, it, and it's, you know, something that we need to make sure is that, you know, depending on where you came from, if you came from a certain German immigrant group, a lot of times you were coming from a distinct region in Germany that had its own language. So, you know, categorizing them all as German is something we do today, but back then, you, they weren't called German, they were called Bavarian, they were called Baden or Westphalian or Hanoverian. So, and um, when you can include Swiss and Austrians, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, Lux, Luxembourg, but uh, so we should, I should apologize at the outset to historians uh, for using an anachronism because German, or German unification comes later, you know, 1870, mm -hmm. 1871. Um, but as you pointed out, these were regions, these were mm -hmm. little dukedoms, uh, um, you know, a town like Westphalia. Um, people kind of moved on masse um, and had help 
um, from family members or those who came first in making those kinds of uh, connections and networks. So uh, it's a complex phenomenon that mm -hmm. we have to generalize, otherwise we can't talk at all. <laughs> and, and kind of the second part of that question, or at least though related to that question, is something that I'm going to definitely direct at you based on your expertise. But um, uh, Liz brings up that Germany has its own distinctive regions and regional cultures, largely due to the fact, like you said, that unification and this idea of Germany as one country came later on in the 19th century. And for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, uh, this, these were individual regions that kind of acted like their own countries and had their own, like she said, regional cultures. Um, so Arthur, in your experience, has Missouri's German um, communities, have they been more influenced by a particular region or customs more than others? Any examples of, of very, you know, distinctly, uh, you know, cultural icons or cultural practices that we find that are distinct to a certain region? Well, certain, my own background um, of Lutheranism shows up in places like Perry County or Concordia. The uh, Saxon Lutheran emigration uh, was a very important factor for, for some communities. Um, you can go to a lot of communities like Westphalia and uh, the, you know, venerable Catholic Church is prominently displayed, um, has pride of place in the landscape. Um, so you know, many of the communities have strong Catholic roots. Um, in a place like St. Louis, for example, you, you know, the people in, uh, in my own neighborhood, there was Zion Lutheran Church, and then down the block was St. Laborious Catholic Church. And even though you know, people call themselves of German descent, pretty clear on Sunday morning, where their loyalties really lay. Uh, but there were also, um, I think especially in the cities, in cities like St. Louis especially, uh, free thinkers, the, uh, if you will, free radicals from the 1848 revolution, people like uh, Carl Schurz. Um, and so that's, you know, that's an important uh, um, element as well. You know, to, to assume they're all Catholic or German, that's, again, that's a, a mistake. A gradation, certainly, but uh, um, there were elements, you know, the German Jewry was represented. Uh, I mentioned the, the free thinkers, which was an important movement. So take your pick. I mean, they're all out there if you want to explore. Yes, for sure. And I, I think, again, it kind of goes back to the question of, um, you know, it depends, like you said, where where you came from. Um, again, Perry County is another is, is again an example of uh, of very specific regions in Germany um, that that settled there and to this day still maintain a lot of the traditions um, of where the you know of the region in Germany where their descendants came from, or what, of where their uh, ancestors came from. Um, I think as you get into bigger areas like St. Louis, it becomes a little bit more convoluted because, you know, St. Louis being such a major, um, you know, place where people would come and then branch out, you know, it, it ended up being more of a, a melting pot of different, um, you know, regional representation. But, um, you know, as you get into some of the smaller communities, they were very much a, a product of the region where they came from in Germany. Um, so, so another kind of important, um, Something important to consider with this book is um, you've used the term several times, the, you know, the importance of remembering the past, but when outlining and subsequently writing the book, um, how do you balance three really important things, obviously past, present, and future. So when writing a book such as this that is meant to remember the past, um, explore the opportunities, the sites, the, the food, um, the regions that we have now, but also celebrate and, um, and look to the bright future of, of German cultural heritage in Missouri. How do you balance those three, the past, the present, and the future when writing a book like this? We do it every day ourselves, right? That's <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what well, was kind of the model, but uh, um, to begin with, uh, there's a wonderful poem by Walt Whitman 
He talks about singing my day is singing the great achievements of the present, but first to sound and ever sound the cry with thee, O soul, the past, the past, the past, the sleepers in the shadows. For what is the present after all but a growth out of the past? And as you were talking at the very beginning of sort of the surprise you sometimes feel at learning, wow, I didn't realize, you know, the roots here. I think it's really trying to create what uh, literary critic Northrop Fry called an expanded present. That is to, like you said, balance the past, present, and the future. So in a sense, well, I didn't try and write a history. Um, if you want to see what a history looks like, or <laughs> here's another approach. This is from, this is probably the masterwork. This is Charles Van Ravenway's uh, classic uh, arts and architecture of German settlement in Missouri. And I studied this back in the mid 70s when I was kind of doing historical research. And again, in the 80s when I was working um, on my doctorate at St. Louis University. So there's a lot there already. So what, what could I do? What could I bring to this whole um, effort? And the idea of trying to balance the, uh, our heritage, what's, what gets passed on is basically how I approached it. Uh, what's worth passing on or where can we put our emphasis? The genesis of the book, quite frankly, for me, it was when I was working at the Museum of Art and Archaeology as the academic coordinator, um, a very important book came out by Neil McGregor, who was the director of the British Museum, which is a really big place with a lot of artifacts that you know, some people said, you know, should go back to Egypt and Greece, but that's another story. But what he tried to do was to write um, a history of the world or an interpretation of the world in 100 objects from the museum. That's a pretty formidable task, but um, he did it so well that uh, I began to think, wow, maybe there's some way to get a handle on Missouri's enormous German heritage. I can't replicate Charles Van Ravenway's book, um, nor should I, you know, I'm, that's not my area of expertise. So just thinking about, you know, the sense of place, how things fit together. And then, you know, with each topic, trying to look at where it came from, but always starting with an artifact, always starting with some, some object, just like McGregor did, looking at its roots and asking, you know, what is it, what did it mean to the person who created it? to a, his or her audience. And then finally, a key question in museum studies, what does it mean to us today? So I think that's how I tried to, uh, to balance those different elements. And if it doesn't help us in the future, if it's not, you know, if it doesn't have survival value, especially today, uh, maybe, okay, it's, perhaps of antiquarian interest, but um, I'm looking for things that can speak to us today, speak to me today. And that's, you know, finally my bottom line was, does this interest me? Does this really resonate with me? And if, you know, if not, I couldn't make it resonate to anybody else. So uh, just try to find those things that seemed unique, seemed uh, compelling, um, had interesting stories or uh, maybe the object itself was of interest like the beautiful uh, zither at uh, you know in the Washington Museum and uh, and then talk to them I talked to the artifacts and they talked back and that's that's how it came out <laughs> um. So we have a couple of questions. One of them, um, I don't mean to evade, and this is Sarah's question, but um, I don't want to uh, get too much into the topics that we're going to explore later on in the book because uh, she brings up a topic that I think you address pretty 
um, pretty well, which is um, some German architecture in the corridor and throughout Missouri. And you give some pretty specific examples. Um, one of them I can bring up um, just to pique people's interest is the Pelster House Barn. Um, and the house barn is an architectural style that is extremely rare to find these days. Um, and I think the one that we have here in Missouri, which is the Pelster House Barn, is one of, I think, six, it's less than a dozen that exist still in the United States. So, um, so the topic of German architecture um, is, is something we'll talk about later on in the series. So, um, so Sarah, I hate to not answer your question, but I also don't want to spend too much time talking about something that we will get into some detail with later. Um, she definitely, or she mentions that her home is of Missouri German vernacular style, and she's working on getting it on the register. So, uh, so good luck with that. Um, we've done the national register process ourselves. Uh, it's daunting, but uh, I hope that hope it ends up being worth it for you. Um, I, I just want to add my uh, support for for Sarah. Um, good luck with that. I worked on a national register nomination back in the mid seventies. I know how daunting it can be, but how exciting. And as you, as you read the publication, hopefully, that uh, you'll see that I draw quite heavily upon some National Register nominations. And uh, they're excellent sources of information. And to talk about a German style, maybe over uh, generalizing again, um, there were dis distinct regional styles, and I think that the uh, the house barn is interesting in that regard because it's used by a person of northern German descent, but it's really more of a southern German um, vernacular tradition. Why? Um, you'd have to ask uh, the noted folklorist Howard Marshall, who wrote a wonderful piece about it. But um, yes, the seeing those things in um, brick and mortar and wrought iron, that's, that's an, a real good way to get in touch with sense of place and with that spirit of um, German um, <laughs> craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to put out a call here. Um, if, if you've got some questions you want us to answer, um, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, before I'd like to start wrapping this up. Um, there are endless topics we could talk about, I know that, but um, this is meant to be a bit of an intro to, to the book and some of the overall themes as we um, then again delve into each individual chapter over the next uh, several months. So um, next month uh, we will start with chapter two uh, and uh, we'll delve into individual themes. Um, but is there a quiz? I should make a quiz. That would be fun. <laughs> I don't have one. There's a survey. That can be a quiz. That's certainly uh, it's the most important quiz of all is the surveys. Um, so, so next next year or next year, next month, um, we are we're talking about chapter two, which is called Marking the Spirit of the Times. And it uh, talks about several um, sites throughout Missouri. And uh, I think it'll be a really cool chapter. So um, make sure to join us next month. Um, and it's the second Thursday of each month from now through April at 10 a.m. So same time, same place. Um, but we have a few questions that are coming in. So um, Could I just say one, one thing yeah. before we address the questions? The title of this intro chapter is Ein Bildungsroman, uh, which is a German term, um, kind of a unique German form to a certain extent of the life formation novel. And uh, Bildung was a term used by, co perhaps coined by the German educator Wilhelm von Humboldt. And he was very interested in education reform and create opportunities for people to continue to develop their character, both um, as individuals and as part of the community and part of the common good. And what Missouri Humanities is doing, in, and I'm, I'm not getting paid to say this, I'm, I'm saying it because that's why I participate, is they take that tradition seriously, that the building, the creating our own character, our expanding ourselves, and hopefully seeing relationships to the common good, the common life. Um, that's what these series, this series is for, and, and what Missouri Humanities does so well. So um, anyway, Kudos on that, and hopefully people appreciate the uh, the opportunity. Yeah, 
Um, this is a quick question. I have a very quick answer, which is um, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, so someone asked if all sessions will be available to view later. Um, yes. So this is uh, being recorded, but it's also being broadcast live on Facebook. And uh, if you want to view any of these sessions at a later date or share them with anybody who might be interested, um, you'll just have to go over to our Facebook page and it'll be on our videos tab. Um, and it's live and then will be uh, stored and housed on our Facebook page uh, for the foreseeable future. And so that will be with each, uh, each part of the series. Um, Bob asks, uh, Arthur, I'm not aware of this, so uh, maybe Arthur and your, and your vast knowledge you will. Um, Bob says that there is a German discussion group that meets quarterly and has for many years the Casey Midcotton and Public Library Genealogy Branch. Um, I feel like I'm going to butcher this name, so I apologize in advance. Um, it's led by Iveta Blautova uh, and among has many topics, um, research places in Germany and folks in case where folks in Casey had ancestors. So um, any knowledge of that, it sounds super cool, um, but I did not know that that existed. So that's good to know. What is the location again? The Casey Midcontinent Public Library at the genealogy branch. And what, what city or town? KC, Kansas City, sorry. Kansas City. Yeah. I, um, I'm not, not aware of that. Uh, I, I won't, I mean, I certainly value Kansas City, but uh, actually I don't travel that much these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, any heads up to anybody on that side of the state, um, you know, feel free to look that up and check it out. Sounds like certainly a worthy uh, group to get involved in if people are interested in expanding. I do know that Kansas City has a sister city. I think theirs is Hanover, um, if I remember correctly. So, uh, you know, lots of ways to get involved in the German, or German history on that side of the state. Um, I think I've got time for one more question for you, Arthur. Oh. I, Are you aware I, of any similar German history groups meeting in St. Louis? I know we have a German cultural society. Um, there's a German culture center at Amsel. Um, there are several groups. We have a, a German sister city, a St. Louis Stuttgart sister city that does a lot of partnership programs with, uh, with Stuttgart, Germany. Um, but yes, lots of opportunities that I know of in St. Louis. And I just, I happen to be from St. Louis, so I, I know some of those. Um, but uh, Arthur, you were going to say? I was just going to recommend the Deutschheim Verein um, in Hermann, Missouri. And it's affiliated with or a friends or auxiliary association for Deutschheim State Historic Site. Um, and so I encourage, I mean, it's, it's mid-state, mid if you will. And uh, it's, it's really the whole mission of Deutschheim State Historic Site is to um, focus on, if you will, 19th century um, German life in Missouri. And they, they publish an, uh, have a publication called Der Maibaum, which uh, publishes some wonderful articles. So there are opportunities for scholarly research as well as to affiliate yourself with you know, people like, like those you Bob described in Kansas City or you, know, you mentioned in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a question. Someone asked, uh, Krista asked if uh, we worked with Dr. Anita Mallinckrodt, who was active in Augusta. Oh. Um, yes, Anita uh, is a wonderful, wonderful woman, wonderful scholar. Um, she, we did work with her very closely. Um, I was lucky to be uh, there when uh, Sean Ross, the State Historical Society's oral historian, and I recorded her oral history, which happened to be um, just within a year of before she died. So we were able to record her oral history and that is housed at the State Historical Society of Missouri. And she has a wonderful, wonderful story, amazing life, the, the ventures she has had. Um, but in addition to that, she um, was uh, considered the town historian in Augusta. She was a wealth of knowledge. Um, her family had been in the Augusta area for, for many, many generations. Um, so yes, we had the privilege to work with her. She was part of our um, scholar team when we did our interpretive plan. Um, yes, uh, she, she brought so she brought so much passion to yeah. Missouri's German heritage, and uh, um, you know I could I could tell that she she was afraid that we're losing that heritage. So um, actually, there's a section in the essay I did about uh, the zither about the uh, uh, Germans, German, Missouri German musical heritage, which is a little homage to uh, 
Dr. Mallinckrodt. So yes, yes we did and uh, we're better for it. Yes, absolutely. She uh, she's written um, several books. Um, she, you know, if you do a quick Google search of her, um, I'm sure you can find her um, her uh, her publications, her work, her oral history. Again, um, is housed at the State Historical Society um, and is certainly worth a listen. She the experiences, like I said, she's had are, are unparalleled and kind of once in a lifetime um, memories and experiences that she shared with us. Um, so rest in peace, Anita. Uh, we miss her very, very much. Um, she, it was a huge, huge loss when she died a few years ago. Um, so, uh, so thank you for, for bringing her up and uh, letting us share a little bit about her. Um, so uh, I, I don't see any new questions, but I'm going to, um, we've got oh, a couple minutes a left. There was a question about what was her name again? Dr. Anita Malincrot? Yes, I'll type that out. I think that's what the question yes, is. Yes, what is her name again? Dr. Anita Mallinckrodt, and I'll type that out for you all. Um, so Arthur, as we kind of wrap up here, um, so I would say as we as we end our, our kind of introductory uh, chapter today and work uh, for the next few weeks to put together chapter two and the subsequent chapters, um, what would you like people to know about the publication, the process of writing it, et cetera, before we really get into the nitty gritty of each chapter over the next several months? Uh, what's my time frame? Uh, one minute. One <laughs> Two minute. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're all fine. Right. Take a couple of minutes. <laughs> it's all connected. We, Shakespeare wrote, we murder to dissect. We take... Um, take things apart in order to get you know, um, a handle on them, but it's all connected. And that's really the thrust of, or the, the emphasis of the publication itself. And again, um, I continue to emphasize that um, calling it my book is a misnomer. I'm the screenwriter for a, a great play that's continuing to play itself out, quite frankly. And as, if you look at the publication, you'll see that uh, wonderful examples from Missouri life, you know, go and explore this, or, uh, you know, you need to try this, this food here, or um, um, I included my field notes, if you will, what we call Das Tagebuch, the daily journal, um, just to show you kind of what came to mind as I was exploring a particular topic. I hope that people will also use it for their own type of book um, to write down what you think, you know, what does it mean to you? It's, it's going to mean something different, I'm sure. Um, but anyway, comparing and contrasting is what makes it interesting. But from the biggest scale, if you will, the entire landscape of the German Heritage Corridor down to um, cemeteries and festivals and museums. I believe there's continuity there. So we'll take each part separately and we'll kind of, it kind of works by scale, if you will. But, uh, you know, the past is prologue that what you read later grows out of what came before. So it's all connected. Does that help? Yes. It does. Everything you say helps, Arthur. Um, so, so Gosh, we are. Talk to my wife. Will you? <laughs> eh, we love Cheryl. Um, so it is just now 11 o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up um, by inviting you all to make sure you join us for um, chapter two, uh, marking the spirit of the times. Uh, and we'll talk about things like uh, there's a lot of sites um, that are commemorative of German heritage in this chapter. Um, there's Tower Grove Park, German Cultural Society, Missouri Civil War Museum, Walden Spring Conservation Area, Holocaust Museum and Learning Center, among many others. So um, we'll dive into that on October 8th, Thursday, October 8th at 10 a.m. Um, if you have already been registered for the series, you are registered for each, um, each month. So you won't have to re-register and you'll use the same Zoom link that we sent you um, for the rest of the series. So we hope that you join us. Um, please, please, please fill out our program survey that you'll receive via email here shortly. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for, for joining us today. We hope you uh, join us uh, over the next several months. 
And um, it's like a field trip without leaving home. Exactly. And that's perfect because <laughs> we're not supposed to leave home. <laughs> so uh, again, thank you, everybody. And uh, uh, for those of you, again, I posted the um, information to purchase the book in the webinar chat feature. So you can scroll up and down and get that if you need to. I also posted it in the comments on the Facebook video. So um, if you need it after we exit Zoom, uh, it'll be on Facebook. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful day and it uh, looks like we're getting some cooler weather here in Missouri over the next week. So that's wonderful. And I hope you all enjoy the nice weather that's coming up the next uh, upcoming weekend. And we will see you all next month. Arthur, thank, thank you. you. And thank we'll see you, you soon. Bye can everybody. I go, can I go home now? You can go home now. <laughs> Bye everybody. <laughs>